everything went into a kind of slow motion. And I, I just, it was as if the glass was just suspended in air from the crash. And it was, and then I just saw like my inception all the way up to that moment. Um, and I just saw my whole life literally. And it was, it, it was just this, as if I lived my life a second time, but in a moment. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to continue my discussions with Islamic thinkers or thinkers about Islam. I've had previous guests uh, included Ayan Herzi Ali, Mustafa Akyol, and Mohammed Hijab. I'm pleased to be speaking today with Hamza Youssef, who serves as president of Zaytuna College, a Muslim liberal arts college in Berkeley, California. He's a strong advocate of liberal education in the classical sense. He was raised in a religiously eclectic family, attended Orthodox Christian services and Catholic parochial boarding schools. At the age of 18, after studying the major religions of the world, he converted to Islam. He served as translator for the chief mufti of the UAE and Mauritania, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayo. I'm very pleased today to be talking to Hamza. Welcome. Thanks for agreeing to talk to me today. Yeah, thank you. So you, you had an eclectic upbringing, as your bio indicated. You went to Orthodox Christian services. Were your, were your family Orthodox Christian? I, I have two sides of the family. One were Irish Catholics, and then my mother was half Irish, half Greek. So my Greek grandfather, who was an archon in the Greek Orthodox Church, um, he actually uh, had that influence on, on us. So we were actually raised in his church. But my mother was, um, she was actually, uh, w would have considered herself a Buddhist most of my um, upbringing. And her, her mother, who was an Irish woman, and her brother, my great uncle, uh, were from Georgia. And they actually were interested in Buddhism in the 1920s and moved out to San Francisco. And my great uncle George Fields opened Fields Bookstore, which was the first metaphysical bookstore on the West Coast. Um, and it specialized just in a lot of different ways. He actually was the first publisher of Gurdjieff's works, the Fourth Way works in, uh, in the US. And it's actually still, it's an online bookstore now, Fields Bookstore, but so- So it's getting more, it's getting more metaphysical all the time. It's, it was once a building and now it's virtual and- <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a it's a bad joke, but so you had you were exposed to a lot of different religious ideas by, by the sounds of things when you grew up, um, right? And, and how how much did you learn about Orthodox Christianity? I, well, I had I had my grandfather had us take Greek lessons. I went to Greece. I went to a Greek Orthodox camp when I was twelve years old in Greece. Um, I served the altar in the Orthodox Church. So I, I was reasonably involved. And then I went to Catholic school. So uh, the Orthodox tradition, the Catholic tradition aren't that different, even though they split uh, in the 11th century over a, a diphthong, as Gibbon points out. So when you were a kid and you were going to services, do you, how, can you remember well enough to characterize your beliefs at that time? I mean, I, I started having trouble with the ideas in Christianity, I guess, when I was probably around 12. So... I'm wondering what your reaction was as a thinker that young. I mean, I, I really loved the Greek service. Uh, I loved the Frank incense. They had great, uh, these uh, chants that were quite beautiful. And uh, it was very ritualistic. And I, I, I enjoyed it. I had no problem uh, going to church. Um, I think like many kids at that age, especially growing up, in California uh, during that period, because my formative years were the late 60s and early 70s. So there was a lot of, we're, we're a transitional generation. There were a lot of radical changes happening and California was kind of at the heart of a lot of those things. 
But my mother did expose us to a lot of different uh, faith traditions. She actually took me, uh, we went to synagogues, we went to Buddhist song guys, we went to um, different uh, Christian iterations. Um, she also took me to a mosque when I was 12 years old in uh, Redwood City. Uh, she, and she was of the belief that that much of religion is is a it's this interesting where you're born and where you're brought up and that's going to determine and color the way you view the world and so she had this idea that religions that it's very dangerous to assume just because you were born into something that that's the end all of truth and so she was eclectic in that way. Yeah. So your mother was of the opinion that, I guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, there, there's a couple of aspects to religious thinking that are interesting and relevant, given what you said. I mean, one is to think of it as a set of philosophies and beliefs that you might hold like you would hold a set of philosophical or even academic beliefs. And then another is to become a member of a community, a, a community of belief. And I guess the the argument you might make for the latter point is that there's something, there has to be something that unites all of us in order for us to be a community. And so that proposition is hard to reconcile with the first one, which is that you should be free to choose your beliefs as you would a philosophy. Because if everybody chooses different beliefs, then we have a hell of a time living together. And that can be a problem. Well, I think that's one of the real problems in California. I mean, that's that's a very much a, a, this liberal idea that everything we're free to choose and be whatever we want. And, that, and what do that you does... think of that idea? So it, it, now you're much older than you were when your mother was taking you from place of worship to place of worship. I mean, how would you address the problem of, let's say, the conflict between freedom of choice and religion as philosoph philosophical belief and and religion as a as a cultural centerpiece that unites people? Well, I think that I raised my children Muslim and I, and I hope that they remain in the Muslim faith, but I have to acknowledge the possibility that that might not be the case uh, given where we live and, and the environment. So I, I'm very committed to the Islamic tradition and I believe it to be true. And I think I, you know, I feel like I've acquired clear and compelling evidence for myself of its truth. But I understand the importance of religion as a, a glue that holds things together. And I think when you lose that glue in any culture, you're going to have great problems that uh, emerge out of that yeah, phenomenon. Well, the, the question starts to become very rapidly, if there's no shared ground that's sacred, let's say, to unite people, then what in the world are they supposed to unite around? And because if they don't unite, then they exist in conflict. And so that seems, to, and in confusion and in anxiety, and that seems to be a, a very meddlesome, or what, not meddlesome, very, a very difficult problem. Well, I, I think part of the problem with, you know, modernity uh, is grappling with the fact that a lot of these grand narratives have broken down largely in the 20th century. I mean, the beginnings were happening already in the 17th, 18th century, but by the 20th century, there, uh, amongst the intelligentsia, there's a huge problem, particularly in, in, in the West, but not only in the West. I think even within the Muslim ethos, you already had these um, ideas that were going to massively impact the culture. So it's something we're all grappling with. Um, it's, it's an interesting time in that um, people do have certain uh, abilities to look at things in ways that perhaps growing up in an environment uh, that really dictated to people uh, what they would believe. Norms, for instance, just cultural norms. I mean, a lot of religion ends up being cultural. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, it's a practice, it's a cultural practice. And a lot of people don't ever really have to deal with this. In fact, I think James, uh, Charles Taylor has a very interesting book, uh, Revisiting James, the Varieties of Religious Experience. And he, he talks about this idea that James looks at people who have 
religion in this sanguine sense. They they simply accept their religion that they're born into, and then they and then they just live and practice that. And very often they have very solid lives in that environment. But then he talks about, and he calls those healthy people. Then he talks about the sick people who actually have to grapple with these different phases. He looks at melancholy, religious melancholy, this idea of being in a melancholic state about the, the alienation of the world, about the trials of the world, the uncanniness of the world, the strangeness of it. And then I think the second he looks at the, just the, the problem of evil, grappling with this problem of evil. And the third one is this sense of wrongdoing, right? That that a lot of people feel sinful. Yeah, that's a terrible one right now. I mean, I think part of the reason why our culture is riven apart by political trouble at the moment is because issues that should be discussed at the level of the sacred have started to be discussed at the level of the political. And so there's a per- pervasive accusation against, let's say, Western culture in particular, coming from the more radical side of the left, claiming that our culture or the Western culture is a tyrannical patriarchy and an oppressive colonial enterprise. And of course, all cultures are contaminated with catastrophe and atrocity as well. And we actually need to know what to do about that. You know, the Christian doctrine of original sin is some help in that because it makes the fact of the legacy of human evil, let's say, something personal, but also transpersonal at the same time, right? It's part of the human condition. And it looks to me like without that container, the guilt we have about the arbitrariness of life and the arbitrariness of our privileges can start to become overwhelming, and then it can also become weaponized, which has certainly happened at, our, at, the present, at the present time, and to a dangerous degree. So you can go after people for their privilege, let's say, and they do feel guilty because advantages and disadvantages are sort of parsed out to some degree arbitrarily, and then you know they collapse in the face of that onslaught and apologize and retreat, and it just doesn't look to me like that's a good thing at all. Well, it's, it's not a good thing if you don't have a religious worldview that gives meaning to those situations. For instance, I mean, one of the most important aspects of the Quran, I think, is that it really gives answers to these uh, in- inequities in the world, but it, what uh, some have termed the mystery of iniquity. And the, uh, the Quran, one of the hallmarks of a believer is uh, gratefulness gratitude. In fact, the word in Arabic for disbeliever means ungrateful, an ingrate. Hmm. Um, and, and so gratitude for blessings and then patience for trials and tribulations. And, and so there's many verses in the Quran that talk about that we have raised some of you over others in privilege as a test to show who will be the best in action? Who, what are you going to do with those privileges? Mm-hmm. How are you going to respond to those tribulations? So if you have a, a, a worldview that actually incorporates all of the problems in the world and gives them meaning, then it enables people to look at them in a very different way. Whereas if you remove that, you're stuck with just Marxist resentment okay, so, and, yeah, and yeah, envy. Yeah. So, all right, let's, I'm going to go back to your conversion, because I want to understand how that happened, but I'm happy about the direction this discussion is taking. So it seems to me that when you realize that you're, let's say, arbitrarily blessed by a certain set of advantages, now everyone is cursed with a certain set of disadvantages too, so we can take that into account. But so you're grateful for your privileges, let's say, you regard them as a gift, or maybe you regard them as something akin to grace. And then it seems to me that the appropriate thing to do is attempt to atone for them, which is that you try to make your advantages work for you and for everyone else to the best of your possible ability. And then in some sense, you pay you pay for, for having them that way. You're given a gift and then you do what you can with it. You do the best you can with it and share it with people and 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 don't try to take narrow advantage of it. And you said that there are, there's Islamic commentary on that kind of idea. And so maybe you could walk me through that a bit. 
gratitude, that's a very interesting one because it does seem to me that it's certainly easier on people psychologically if they're grateful for what they have rather than resentful and bitter about what they don't have. And why is that associated with belief per se, let's say in, in Islam? Well, first of all, the gift of being itself. I'm just the, the participation in being is a great gift. And in fact, the, you know, the, the, the German word for, for guilt is actually a sense of debt. And so the, and the word in Arabic for religion is debt. It means debt. So we, we, we have this sense of indebtedness because we've been given so much. Just, just the gift of life itself is just such an extraordinary gift. And so religion, you know, in the Islamic understanding, it's, it's an act of gratitude. It's you're showing gratitude for all that you've been given. And in fact, when you get reached the highest levels of our tradition, even the tribulations are seen as gifts because they're actually um, ways in which we learn. There's an unveiling that happens and great knowledge comes out of suffering. Great knowledge comes out of trials and tribulations. And so in, in, in our tradition, the highest people are those who actually are, are grateful in trials and tribulations as well as in blessings and gifts. Because yeah. they see it all as a gift. I always think of Nietzsche's comment on it when that sort of idea comes up, which is whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger because uh, the reverse of that is whatever doesn't make you stronger kills you. And the the problem I think that people face when they're trying to be it grateful could, it, it, for, so, sorry, for tribulations right. is that you can learn from them, but they can also just grind you into the ground and destroy you. And they do. I mean, people do die. We suffer and die. And so right. in the final analysis, in some sense, we're defeated by by our mortal vulnerability. And when well, it, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, well, when it visits you, when a catastrophe visits you, sometimes you recover and you think, well, I learned a lot, but I don't know if it's, I don't know how salutary it is in general to make that a general case. You know what I mean? Given that people suffer so much and sometimes it seems so pointless. I know what you mean psychologically, you know, if you're suffering with something catastrophic and you become resentful, that certainly makes it far worse. There's no doubt about that. And, and it makes you a danger to people around you. So it's not helpful, but it's sure understandable. Well, there's a, there's a very interesting, uh, do you know Jacques Le Soron? That he wrote a book called "And There Was Light." He, no. he was a he was a he was a French resistance fighter, and he wrote he he wrote this very interesting autobiography. But one of the things that happened to him when he was eight years old, he was in school, and he, and some some kid accidentally bumped into him, and he fell onto the desk, and he ended up losing both his eyes uh, in that in that event. But one of the things that he said that really struck me when I read that was. He said that he was very grateful to God that that happened to him as a child. And then he gave two reasons. The first reason was he said a child's body is still supple and they're still coming into their body. So to lose his sight at that time was, was very useful because somebody who's older, if they lose their, their sight, it's very difficult for them to readjust to the world. That was the first reason for his gratitude. But the second reason was he said, a child does not question uh, injustice of events. It doesn't think that events are unjust. It, it can see injustice from people, but events just happen to children and they don't uh, really put that valence on it as something, why did God do this to me? And as somebody who worked in, in pediatrics for a period as a, as a registered nurse, it always struck me, you know, the parents were always devastated, but the children were in these uh, quite extraordinary states. And Le Soran says that it's only when parents actually give the child that idea of, of uh, that something's wrong here, will they, will they do that? But normally children just simply accept that. And I think that has a lot to do with what Christ said that, you know, that the way you come to God is like, like children. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's at the heart of it is just accepting because the sense of entitlement that human beings have is overwhelming. This idea that we're all entitled to health, that we're entitled to, uh, 
wealth that we're entitled to uh, for things to work out. It's, it's not the way life is designed. It never was. And it's something that the ancients really understood. And I think modern people have a really difficult time grappling with this because they're not well spiritually. And pre-modern people, I think, generally were much healthier uh, spiritually. And certainly all of these pre-modern civilizations understood that life was trial and tribulation, first and foremost. I mean, the Quran actually says that it's God who created death and life to try you, to, to show, to reveal who is the best of you in actions. And so accepting that is, is a really great um, is a is a really great gift. And, and if anything, I mean that's the gift of grace. One of one of the great um, uh, scholars of our tradition said that he was so burdened. His name was Ibn Atayla, he was an Egyptian, but he, he said he was so burdened with, with uh, his self. And he went to this teacher, um, Abul Abbas and Morsi. And he, when he came in, he said to him, all of the world is just four conditions. And each of those conditions has a response. The first condition is blessing and the response is gratitude. The second condition is tribulation and the response is patience. The third condition is obedience and the response is humility is to see the, the grace in that obedience. And the, and the fourth uh, circumstance is sinfulness and the response is repentance. So that's a taxonomy for life itself. So repentance, that's an interesting one because one of the things our culture seems to have a difficult time with too is allowing people to repent in this social media in particular seems to have put a lot of advantage in the hands of accusers and attackers. And so people are mobbed or canceled or so forth. Um, and it, it's a rare person who doesn't have something in their past, let's say, that might make them the target of such treatment. But, and that means that's a universal problem as well. And it isn't obvious that we have a mechanism for repentance and reintegration that's nearly as powerful as the mechanisms we've developed for accusation and exclusion. I guess I'm. I guess I should throw a question on to the end of that. No, no, that's well, fine. I thought I, well, I, you looked no, like you were still thinking about it, so I didn't well, want to interrupt your I'm, thought. I'm just. I guess what I'm wondering is, what what? How would you characterize the Islamic view of repentance? And pe people talk a lot about the necessity to forgive, hey, and I've thought that through fairly thoroughly as a clinical psychologist, because forgiveness isn't, in my estimation, isn't just a, a simple act of letting something go, because if something's bothering you, it's not that easy to let it go. If, if you have a problem with someone, it, it, there's a gospel story about that, that you're not supposed to go pray in the church if you have a fight with pending with your brother, an unresolved fight with your brother, you straighten that out first. My experience as a clinician has been that for forgiveness to take place, generally speaking, there has to be a discussion between the parties involved, or at least a very lengthy session of thought by the person who's aggravated and offended to take apart the offense to detail out its characteristics, to separate the wheat from the chaff, to understand exactly what went wrong, to negotiate an agreement moving forward that such things won't happen. Like there's, there seems to be this continual interplay between judgment and forgiveness in something that's, that really is akin to forgiveness. And for you to repent about something that you've done, it seems to me that the same process of discrimination has to take place is, well, I did something wrong. Well, exactly what did you do wrong? And exactly why did you do it? And why do you think it was wrong? And what do you think that you should have done better? And how are you going to conduct yourself in the future? And two questions then. One is that in keeping with your understanding of what constitutes repentance. And second, what are the Islam, what, how would you characterize Islamic thought on that particular matter? Well, I, it's, the Islamic tradition, like the Jewish and the Christian before, ha have this idea of repentance. Um, 
the the in uh, the Greek uh, New Testament word metanoia is a beautiful word because it's really uh, you know the idea of transforming the mind, changing the mind. Uh, in Arabic, it's the idea of turning, and and so there's there's this idea that the heart turns towards disobedience and then it has to turn back towards obedience, and so that that turning then one of the names of god is tawab in arabic which means the off turning the one who turns back when you turn to god god turns to you uh, and so this idea of turning back to god is very important and the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he taught us actually to do this at least 70 times a day so muslims as a as a practice actually ask forgiveness um, preferably at least 70 times a day, just saying Astaghfirullah. It's something that we do as a spiritual practice. And part of the reason why we pray five times a day, the Prophet ﷺ was once asked about a man who lives next to a river and he goes into it and he washes five times a day. He said, do you think that you would see any filth on him? And they said, no. And he said, that's what prayer is. It's like washing, it's like bathing in a river five times a day. I mean, one of the reasons we do lustration with uh, water is a ritual purification. So we wash our face, we purify our, our eyes and our, and our tongue. We actually rinse our mouth with water before we pray. And, and then we wash our, hand, our limbs and then our feet. And, and the idea is about really turning back to God, because these gifts that we've been given, these seven limbs that we have been given are gifts from God that should be used in good. And so the idea, it, you know, it, it's interesting that in, in Old English, in New Testament Greek and Hebrew and Arabic, the word for sin is an archery term, mm -hmm. which means to, to miss the miss mark. Miss the mark. Yes, absolutely. Right. And, 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 and so this idea, you know, uh, uh, this, this great basketball player was, was once asked what he thought about when he missed a shot. He said, too far, too short, too much to the left, too much to the right, that, that that's what sin is. It's, it's basically, we, we, there's omission or commission. We did so, too much of something, too little of something to deviate to the left or the right. And so it's finding that sweet spot of obedience uh, and being in a state of, of ritual purity. And then we have conditions. So in order for a repentance to be sound, uh, it has to be sincere. The person actually has to have a sincere repentance. It has to be done like if you're actually right. engaged and sincere, in it. Yeah. Si sincere means to recognize the wrongdoing and to strive not to do it again. Would that yeah, be a because, definition because of sincerity? I Yeah, it, Sincerity, the Arabic word for sincerity is related to the word for purity and untainted. Mm -hmm. And and so it's done without ulterior motives because sometimes right. people will, will ask forgiveness and they just don't want to be cut out of the will. Right. right. That's so an they're, instrumental they're, forgiveness, right? Exactly. It's, it's yeah. Okay. So you, you talk, this is quite interesting. So you wandered through territory there that linked up physical disgust and contamination with psychological and spiritual disgust and contamination. And it's my experience with people that a good number of them feel guilty and out of sorts and alienated a good amount of the time. And you say, well, this, that sin means to miss the mark. And the reason they feel alienated, at least in principle, is because they're missing the mark. And of course, then the question is, well, what exactly is the mark? And it seems to me that you 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 drew a parallel between prayer and washing and both of them are to remove disgusting contaminants let's say and one of the signs that someone has a conscience although conscience can be overact active and that can be a problem is that they are laboring under a burden of self disgust and self contempt and they do feel their moral transgressions as something contemptuous and beneath them and base. And so this prayer upward, let's say, to a higher aim and a reminder of that, which in your tradition, you're doing at least five, you're doing five times a day. That's a constant attempt to set yourself on the right track so that your aim can be true. 
that it's a reorientation. It's a reorientation. Yeah. Do you think, even physiologically speaking, it seems likely that there's a relationship between the the idea of decontaminating yourself by becoming clean and spiritually decontaminating yourself with reference to something to a higher aim. Well, I think people do, like you said, and I'm sure you've seen this a lot in clinical practice, people do feel unwell and, yeah. they, and they feel sick. And, and modern psychology attempts to give them, you know, the antichristic formula is to say, unlike Christ who said, go and sin no more. You know, the, the antichristic formula is to say, go and there's no more sin. So I'm just going to remove that bag of bricks that you're, you're right. carrying well, you around can't, called, you can't, called guilt. You absolutely can't do that as a therapist. You know, it, it's not it's not even technically possible, I don't believe, because sometimes you might see somebody who has an overactive superego, you know, if you want to speak in a Freudian sense, and there are people who punish themselves extremely harshly. And then you might say their sin is excessive use of force on their self in relationship to their transgressions. And that's, and then maybe you help, once you understand that with them, you help them understand how it might be possible to use the lightest touch possible that still serves the purpose, which is a good limit idea with regards to the administration of punishment towards yourself, right? Minimal necessary force. That's a good common law tradition. It's a good psychological tradition. But a, a therapist certainly can't alleviate people's guilt arbitrarily by telling them, you know, well, there's nothing really there to worry about. They have to do all that thinking through that themselves. And this very interested in this relationship between disgust, physical, the physical sense of disgust and the psychological sense of disgust and the notion that, I mean, it's one form of prayer, you might say in Christianity is baptism. That'd be in some ways the most fundamental form of prayer. It's rebirth in the Christian tradition. And it involves, obviously it involves the use of water, sometimes a full body immersement. And so there's a notion of purification there. It seems to me that in the modern world, people don't know what to do with the sense they have that they're bad, right? It impl implies that there's a good, because you wouldn't feel bad if there wasn't a good, but it isn't obvious what the good is that should be aimed at. Well, that's the difference between real and apparent goods. And so, I mean, one of the most important things about any true religious tradition is it has to distinguish between real and apparent goods, because... The reason they use that archery term is that people are always looking for a good. It's just, if, if you don't have the discernment to distinguish between a real and an apparent good, and so discernment is very important, what, what the Quran calls Furqan. In fact, the Quran itself is, it terms itself as a Furqan, a discernment, a standard, by a criteria, a criterion that you can judge actions. We have a great, um, uh, book in virtue ethics called Mizan al-Amal, the standard or the criterion of action, uh, which uses definitely some of the motifs that are in the Nicomachean ethics, but it's, it's this interesting amalgam between that Hellenistic uh, tradition and then infused with the Quranic theological virtues. You know, I, I wanted to just add, I forgot to uh, mention the, the other two um, necessary conditions for a sound uh, repentance. One of them was that you made a firm intention not to go back to that action. And then the, the fourth one is that it, if it involved a wrong of another person, then you had to ask them forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had to go and you had to, like if you stole, then you had to actually give the money back. Right. If you, right. Could, if you didn't know who you stole it from, you actually give it in charity in that person's name. Right, so that's part of discharging that debt. The debt, exactly. Right, and it's certainly the case that people seem to feel innately, I would say, something akin to a psychological debt. And that, well, and that we discussed already the fact that that can be weaponized, you know, by, by accusations of arbitrary privilege and so forth. And so it, is, it isn't easy to know what to do with that. So let's go back just for a moment to... to your religious upbringing. Tell me what led up to your conversion, if you would, and 
And why did you move away from Christianity or Buddhism or all the things that you were exposed to when you were well, growing I, up? Well, I, ha- I, ha- I was in a head-on collision and survived a, a car accident that the California Highway Patrol said I shouldn't have survived. And uh, I, had, I had what they call a near-death experience. I got very interested in what happens after you die. I realized that I could have very easily transitioned. Um, and so I was very interested in what happens after death. I actually went and met with Dr. Raymond Moody, who wrote the books on life after life. And uh, he did a lot of the work with near-death um, people. Can, that I, had had... can I ask you what happened in your near-death experience? Uh, I think it was pretty classic. You know, I, I definitely saw my, it, I went into a very different um, spatial temporal state where I, the, I just, everything went into a kind of slow motion. And I, I just, it was as if the glass was just suspended in air from the crash. And it was, and then I just saw like my inception all the way up to that moment. Um, and I just saw my whole life literally. And it was, it, it was just this, as if I lived my life a second time, but in a moment that, that was the experience. And, and what, so I, that, what did that do for you? That experience? What, how did well, it change? One, the one, I, one, it made me, you know, at the time I was a senior in high school my my probably biggest interests were baseball and and other things, but uh, music was certainly a, a big interest. My my family I come from a family of musicians, so um, I think what it did is it made me really think about death in a very deep way. And if you've ever seen, um, there's a there's a film about a, a man who who's in a, a a plane crash and uh and then he survives the plane crash and is a man who had a lot of fears but he comes out of it jeff bridges is, is the person that and and he's like looking at his hands and am i alive or am i dead i was in that state for about two weeks it was very it was a very strange state to be in uh and that got me interested in in what religions say about after death and so I decided to study all the world religions just from that perspective. And the one that really, really resonated and struck me as having a very, very powerful description was the Islamic tradition. And I actually ended up, uh, ironically, I ended up writing in the, uh, the study of Quran, uh, which was published by uh, uh, Harper, I ended up writing the essay on death in the Quran, which is how I actually became Muslim. So it was a very interesting, serendipitous uh, So walk, walk me through that. So, okay, so you just about died. How old were you? 17. Yeah, so I've, I've, there have been studies showing, for example, that if you have someone, I remember this study, if you have someone jump off a bungee cord watching a digital clock, the clock goes slower for them subjectively. So if you subject people to a tremendous amount of stress, then time slows down. And I suspect the neurophysiological reason for that is that when you're in a tremendous crisis, your body floods itself with the hormones and neurochemicals, probably mostly dopamine that are necessary for you to act extraordinarily quickly. And it's extremely energy intensive to do that so you can't do it all the time but maybe we can snap ourselves into a psychophysiological state where we're a hundred times faster than we would normally be for some very finite amount of time and i'm not trying to what would you say reduce this to a physiological explanation well that's that's a very common reductionist approach yeah 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 well to an experience an experience that I mean, you you can look at the so- the uh, the hard drive aspect of it, but the yes. software is the mystery. Yeah, I'm not, and I'm definitely not trying to remove the phenomenological significance, you know, because that would be foolish. And and even and, those those explanations are only attempts at understanding a phenomenon that we really don't have access to because 
cause and effect is a very difficult thing to, it, to nail it's down. Cer it's, <laughs> it certainly is, yeah. And, and that kind of explanation doesn't account for all the near-death experience phenomena either. But... I mean, I mean, you asked you asked me how you know that that got me thinking a lot about death, you know, right? Irrespective right. of whatever the neurochemical phenomena that were happening within my body, that experience, that phenomenological experience, had a existential right. effect on right. me that right. was very powerful, and and I decided that I really wanted to know if I could have died in that moment which was very possible. I wanted to know what, what if anything happens and if something happens, how do you prepare for that? Like what, you know, it, if, we're on, if we're genuinely on the doors of infinity, then we should take this time that we have very seriously to prepare to go through that door. And that's what existentially, that's what happened to me. I wanted to know, if I can go through that door at any moment, as a 17-year-old, I could have done it. Now, as a 64-year-old, it's possible that I could do it today or tomorrow or the next day. What type of preparation do I need? Why, did you, why do you think that you derived the conclusion that it was something that you needed to be prepared for? That's well, I think that, I, yeah, I, I just think that's a, a kind of... Uh, I just think it's common sense, you know, like, I mean, preparing for death. Well, it's, inter I, it's interesting I, when, because when, you... I, when I worked, when I worked in critical care, what became very clear to me, some people seem to be ready for death and other people are definitely not ready for death. And, and I, and I can see the difference. I saw the difference. You know, I, my, both my parents died. Uh, I was uh, with both my parents and, and I could see, you know, I mean, my mother had an incredible transition. And I think my mother was fully ready to go into the next world. I don't think a lot of people are ready. I think a lot of people are very afraid of death. And I think that's something that uh, one of the gifts of religion is it does remove that fear, not necessarily of the act of, of dying, because obviously that's a very intense uh, experience, especially for those of us who have seen that uh, in people who die. Um, but the, the, the transition into the next world is something the Quran says, it's something to be looked forward to. It's not something to fear, but, but it's also, Islam is not a death cult. The Prophet said, don't desire to die, but ask God for a long life. And, and he said, that none of you should ever desire death. You should desire to have a long life because you have more time to do more good. And the more good you do, the more you accrue in terms of preparation for that transition. And what do you think it means to be prepared versus not prepared to die? Uh, to be in a good state. I think to be like, if, if you're in a state of repentance, if you're if if whatever you've done in the past, if you've really uh, repented for any of the wrongs that you've done, and there's major wrongs and there's minor wrongs, uh, there's there's the peccadillos and then there's the, the those mortal sins that that uh, that are recognized for what they are, things that literally will cause death to the soul. The wages of sin is death. So I think being in a good state, being prepared, being ready to make that transition is very important. And I think in many ways, a lot of uh, the practices that we do in our tradition are in preparation for death. In fact, if you look at just the five prayers, uh, the very first prayer that we do when, when we wake up, the Prophet gave us a, a prayer that I did this morning when I first came into consciousness, which says, praise be to the, the one who brought me back to life because death in the Quran is, uh, sleep in the Quran is seen as a little death. And so it's every morning we have a resurrection that's to remind us of the, the resurrection on the day of judgment. And then the very first thing that we do is we wash and then we pray. That's, that's the first thing that Muslims do when they wake at dawn, when the sun, uh, before the sun comes up. 
And then before we go to bed, that's the last thing that we do. We make a prayer. Oh, God, if you take my soul in my sleep, have mercy on it. And if you let me live another day, then make me amongst the righteous and protect me. These are all prayers that our Prophet did every single day. And then on, on Friday, we have a communal prayer, which is, is the day of gathering, which is related to the day of judgment, where you all stand before God. And then also in Ramadan, we fast. So we were giving up the pleasures of life during the daylight hours for a month. And then the end of it is a celebration of making it through that month, uh, hopefully with as little sin as possible. And then we have the, 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 uh, the, prayer, the, the poor tax, which is to do good to others from the good that you've been given. And then we have the Hajj, which is really a preparation for death because you're making this pilgrimage, you're, you, you get into white clothes, which is the sh to symbolize the shroud, and then you stand on the plain of, of Arafat like the day of judgment, which symbolizes that all of humanity is going to stand in a non-spatial, non-temporal sense, is going to stand before their creator and be judged for what they did. So we believe in a day of judgment. So when you were 16 or 17, how old were you when you had the car 17. accident? 17. 17. And so then you became interested in the issue of death and the meaning of death and the idea of preparation for death. And you read widely throughout the world's religions. And you said that Islam in particular struck your fancy. When did you convert? How old were you? 18. Okay. So that's, 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 was that a radical move as far as your family was concerned? Um, you know, my dad, the first thing he did, he went to Gibbon and reread the section on the rise of Islam. Um, my dad was a professor of philosophy. So, you know, he was a lapsed Catholic. Um, I, probably the most well-read person I've ever met in the Western canon. Um, I think he was intrigued. He didn't really understand it. My mom was fine with it. She thought, great, you know, you found a, a path. That's how she viewed it. But mo both my father, both my parents ended up uh, making the declaration of, of faith before they died. So my father read Ghazali and uh, ended up becoming Muslim. So what was it about specifically about the Islamic treatment of death in the afterlife compared to say the Christian or Jewish treatment that well, attracted one, the, you? One, the Quran is, er, the scent of death is on every page of the Quran. So it's it's definitely a very, very, it's a death reminder and not in a negative way. There's this tension release that happens in the Quran. Um, I was once in a, in a hotel and, 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 and in London, and there was a guy across from me reading the Quran, an English translation and drinking a Heineken beer, which was very interesting. And uh, so I, you know, I was dressed in Western clothes and I just asked him, how are you finding that book? He said, this book is very interesting. And, and I said, in what way? And he said, you know, it's just tension release, tension release. Uh, and uh, I, I said, wow, you got that on the first reading. That's very impressive because it's, you know, it, it'll tell you about all the, the wages of sin, but then it'll tell you about the blessings of, of obedience and, and, and turning to God and repenting and answering the call of the prophets, that perennial call that the prophets to shun false idols, including the idol of the self, uh, to turn away from uh, the vanities of life, the vain appetites uh, that are of no use for you uh, in you, this you world. Earlier, you talked about apparent and real uh, goods. And so you're, you're referring to that in a sense here again, and making the presumption that there is a hierarchy of values and that some things should be pursued in preference to others. And this is something that the modern West has great difficulty formalizing and accepting, although people suffer for it, regardless of their understanding of it. When, when you are thinking about turning your eyes heavenward or getting your aim straight or obedience to God, what do you think, what does that mean to you conceptually? And what does it mean practically in your life? Well, I mean, practically, it means staying within 
the what we call the hudu, the Quran calls the, the limits that God has set on us. So we have certain limits that are set on us. And those limits are to protect us. So everything in the Islamic tradition, uh, according to our Al-Ghazali and others, everything in our tradition is to protect one of six things. To protect religion itself, to protect uh, human intellect, reason. So like the prohibition of alcohol is to protect uh, human reason. Uh, to protect life, sorry, life is the next. To protect life, to protect human reason, to protect property, uh, which is really what Richard Weaver called the last metaphysical right standing you know, the right to property. Um, and, and then to protect um, family and then to protect human dignity. So those six things, there's no ruling in Islam that isn't addressing one of those six preservations. And so everything that we do is, is for, for the, that, that, that's the, the way in which we try to live our lives. So family, being good to family, taking care of those in need around you first and foremost. Charity begins at home and then extending to those closest to you. So Islam is, is antagonistic to socialism. It's antagonistic to any kind of collectivist philosophy, but it does recognize that each one of us should be giving something back to- Okay, so uh, to, sir, to, I'm gonna let you go through that again, but you said something there that's very interesting to me. You said that Islam is antagonistic to a collectivist philosophy. Can you tell me why, why, either why that's true or why you believe it to be true? Well, first and foremost, the Quran itself, because the Quran, if you look at it, it's a book of individuals going against groups that are insane. I mean, every single story in the Quran is an individual who goes up against a group and the group says, burn him, throw him in the fire, stone him. So that, you know, it's pretty clear from the Quran that the group is not necessarily a good thing. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, master yourselves so that you don't become yes people, that when people do good, you do good. And when they do bad, you do bad. But, but be so that when people do good, you're with them. And when they do bad, you refrain from their evil. So it's very important for you know, and one of the tragedies, obviously, is that any group goes into group think. I mean, you, you know, this is an area you're much more familiar with than I am, but uh, group think is a, is a huge problem. And I think the Quran addresses that problem constantly by showing that you have to stand up against the group, because the group, as Nietzsche pointed out, you know, that insanity or madness is unusual amongst individuals, but it seems to be the norm amongst groups. I mean, I, I yeah, think the Kierkegaard Quran... said, Kierkegaard said that the, the group was untruth. He said, even if a truth, an actual truth is claimed by a group instantly, it becomes untruth merely because the group has claimed it. Right? Because, it, that, because but... truth for him was individual in the same sense that you're describing. Do you think that's uh, akin to the Jewish emphasis on the prophetic tradition? I, absolutely, yeah. And but okay. I also think that, that that the Islamic tradition does emphasize the importance of community and the mm -hmm. importance of sociability. You know, this idea that um, that we are gregarious human beings, that we're we're people that we need a society uh, to 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 fully realize ourselves. And it, it's the rare individual that can be the anchorite. You know, as Aristotle said, it's it's either a beast or a god that can live alone. But um, you know, it's a very difficult thing. There are people that can do it, and and I've known a few uh, people like that. And we and we do have a tradition. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that towards the latter days, it's better to avoid all the groups, and that's in a sound tradition because he said the groups would be astray. Okay, so let me ask you a question that's always put to people who are religious. How do you differentiate religious belief from idolatry, from from ideological belief? I, I, I don't personally, I don't think they're the same, by the way, but I'm curious about, you know, because it's pretty easy for someone just to say, well, you talk about standing up against the collective, but you Christians, you Jews, you Islamic types, you're part of a mob just like everybody else. And why does your particular mob view reign supreme in your view? Why isn't that just another 
idle in the desert, just like the rest of them? What makes it different, do you think? Well, I think that you can, you know, as the Bard said, tis idolatry to make the service greater than the God. It's very easy to turn a religion into an idol. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and I think there are, I think that's what the new atheists object to, right? Is that the fact that religious belief can be, maybe it can be hijacked for instrumental and dogmatic purposes, extremely Yeah, as, as if, as if ideology isn't, as if anything can't go wrong. Well, there is I, that. Yes. Yeah. And so, I mean, I don't know, like, I think. You know, these great, the, the 20th century is, is a largely an irreligious century in, in the Western hemisphere. And just look what these uh, it, non-religious ideologies, this, this point has been pointed out by many people. Yes. Uh, one, one of the things about, you know, are, are you familiar with Errol Colnoy, K-O-L-N-A-I? No, I'm, I'm not. K-O-L-N-I-A. Yeah, well, yeah, N-A-I. So he was a Hungarian Jew who converted to Catholicism, but he wrote a very interesting paper in 1951 called The Three Writers of the Apocalypse. He also wrote a book about Nazi Germany in 1938 and really, uh, I think, really What's understood. His, tell me his name again. Errol Kolnoy. K-O-L-N-A-I. Errol. A-U-R-E-L. Yeah. Oh, anyway, oh, he- A-U-R-A-L? A-U-R-E-L. Okay. Colonel, K O L N A. So anyway, he wrote a he wrote an essay called "The Three Writers of the Apocalypse," and uh, he identified three totalitarian ideologies. Uh, he said the first two, fascism and communism, were easy to recognize, but he said that the the real danger dangerous one was progressive liberalism because the seeds of totalitarianism were not seen uh, very easily. It was something that could be missed. So, yeah, so I, well, so when know, I think I, I mean, about this, I think if well, if I had to choose, let's say, if I had to choose the leader of a country, let's say an arbitrarily powerful leader, it seems to me that it would be a better choice for me to select someone who believes that he's beholden to something above and beyond himself, than to choose someone who doesn't have that belief at all. Right, and that seems to me a. It, regardless of what you might say philosophically or even scientifically about the utility of religious belief or the validity of religious belief, the notion that you could be the leader of a powerful country and not be serving something that wasn't only you seems to be a real problem with, a, let's say, a stringently atheistic philosophy, because, well, why wouldn't you just serve you in a position like that? Well, and, and, and you would need, generally, it's the religious traditions that understand service is for not just the self. I mean, we, we obviously have to serve ourselves just to live, but service to others. And that's why political leaders in the pre-modern world, it was always understood that they had the greatest burden of self-discipline, that, that, that they had a greater burden of self-discipline than everybody else. For right, the, for they the have very, greater power and right. greater temptation, and, and so and so the religious traditions. I mean, the the you know the pre modern world understood very well in whatever civilization you were in. They understood very well that the the central problem uh, that human beings are confronted with uh, is their self, and and that the modern modern world has completely lost that idea that you had to uh, master yourself. Hence, hence, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, Confucius said is that, um, you know, that study without thinking uh, is, is blindness, but thinking without study is dangerous, right? And so if you don't study those things that, are, that will equip you to deal with the self, and that's why in our tradition and in all the great traditions, but in the Islamic tradition, the study of the self, psychology, ilm nafs it's termed in Arabic, it was central to our tradition, to understanding the nature of the self, to understanding the machinations of the self, the tricks of the self, how the and, and, and to understand those things so that you could, you could learn to discipline them. I mean, this gets back to, you know, Imam al-Ghazali uses the idea of the sage, the dog, and the pig which obviously, you know, Plato would have said the charioteer and, and the two horses. 
uh, it's the same idea. But you know, the pig is the uh, the concupiscent soul. The the dog is the irascible soul, and then the sage is the is the rational soul. If if the sage is in charge, then things will turn out well. But if 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 you allow the pig or the dog to take over, in our culture, you know, the pig has definitely uh, it's the pig seems to really be having a field day, right? The uh, the pig is doing very well. Mm -hmm. You know, it, uh, the I dog mean, is not doing too bad either. Well, it's interesting because exactly, I, and I think the world is split. You know, Willy Brandt back in the seventies saw this north-south problem of of. I mean, he didn't term it like this, but but I I see it as as the pig and the dog. You know, I mean, if you if if you have affluence on on one spectrum and you have real um, uh, just diminution of goods, just of human goods on the other, you're going to create a lot of resentment. And, and so that's a huge problem that we have. So this idea, you know, Frost talked about fire and ice. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. He was talking about this, the dog and the pig. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire, right? In other words, the world's end will come from the pig just wreaking havoc. And, and, uh, but then he said, but if it had okay. to Paris tw twice, I think of, you know, so uh, let me ask for destruction. You yeah. Ice is sorry. Left. Yeah. No, sorry. Hate please finish that. Ice nice. is. Yeah. Yeah. That, that hate is also great and will suffice, you know, that, that the irascible can do it as well. It's one or the other. It's either going to be fire or ice, okay. but that so that's in the absence, that's in the absence of the, uh, you know, the, the, the sage, it's in the absence right. of wisdom. And wisdom is a word that's not often heard. Yes, well, I've had a lot of discussions with people who regard themselves as explicitly atheistic. You know, and it seems to me that a lot of the discussion about religious belief in atheism misses the mark, let's put it that way. I tend to think of God, if I'm thinking about the idea of God psychologically, I tend to think about something akin to a hierarchy of values, and that's very much similar to the proposition that you're putting forward with the metaphor of the pig and the dog and the sage. That there are some values that are higher than others. And so I would say, I think that's psychologically true that there are some values higher than others. I mean, we tend to put our families before ourselves, for example. And we tend to have a sense that we would, we would like to be good people. Uh, I, I use this, this illustration of the relationship between values. Imagine that you're making a meal. You might ask yourself, well, what are you doing? Say you're cutting up vegetables. Okay, so you're moving your hand back and forth. That's not abstract at all. That's where the mind meets the body. You're moving your hand back and forth to cut the vegetables to put them in the pot, to cook a good dinner, to be a good father, to be a good husband, to be a good citizen, to be a good person. So you're doing all those things at the same time, right? And each of the more particular things nests in the broader value. And the broader a value is, the more other values depend on it. And also maybe the broader a value is, the more other people can be united within it. And so I think you can come to a technical understanding of something like depth of value. And then it seems to me that the religious proposition is that there is an ultimate value that's either at the pinnacle or at the base, depending on how you conceptualize the metaphor. And that that ultimate value is expressed in religious terminolo terminology as the absolute, the ineffable absolute, as the God that's supposed to be served. And in some sense, it has to remain ineffable and beyond comprehension because otherwise it turns into an idol. And so what you do in a religious sense is posit an ultimate ideal, subordinate, subordinate yourself to it, regard it as something that you can only ever approximate to, even in principle, and organize all the other virtues and defeat the faults in relationship to that highest order value. And that's more like, I think part of the reason that religious traditions insist upon faith isn't it's not faith, it's not the faith that the scientists, the scientist 
types, criticize, which is sort of like an empirical statement about the structure of objective reality. It's more like the notion that there is a hierarchy of values and that there's something that has to be absolute, ineffable, and ultimately uniting at the apex that we should be subservient to, you know, that we should consider our, all our behaviors in relationship to. And, and, and so that's, you know, there's not a metaphysics there in some sense, because I, I'm not saying anything about the final nature of that absolute value, right? That's an ontological question. I don't feel qualified to answer it, but I can't see how there can be an absence of an absolute unifying value that's superordinate to all other values without society degenerating into conflict, without people becoming anxious and confused and aimless, without without the consequences being that we all miss the mark. So I guess I'd like well, your comments about that well, idea. I, I mean, yeah, I don't think God's something that we posit. Um, I think, and I also certainly don't think God is a value. Um, I think that God, that we respond to uh, God and, and that God makes a call and that call is through these intermediaries. And, and the prophets, the Quran says in, in the, the chapter called the bee, that there's no nation that hasn't been given warners that say shun idols and worship God. And, and oh, so- well, I wasn't trying to, I wasn't trying to, what would you say, reduce God to a human value. Because I, but a I lot do, of people do. I mean, that's I know, a very I know that. I understand that way of viewing God. Yeah. Well, and that's so, why I insisted upon the ineffability. Well, yeah. However, you want to uh, state that. I mean, I for 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 us, for Abrahamic people in particular, God that we respond to God. God makes a call, and that calls through the prophets. And the prophets are surprisingly consistent, unlike philosophers who the student invariably rejects uh, the master, you know, uh, Plato is a friend, but the truth is a greater friend. Whereas the prophets are extraordinarily consistent in their messaging um, that there is a God, that that God demands that, that uh, you, you live within the limits that God has set as your creator. I mean, one of the things that atheists, to me, uh, the, the atheist, you know, there's a definition of health, um, which, which looks at the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. Uh, George Vithoukos, a great uh, uh, health practitioner from Greece, um, said that atheism is really one of the most serious uh, uh, signs of ill health because it's a denial of your createdness and that you have to really be unhealthy to do that. So he saw it as a deep spiritual sickness to deny your creator, um, whether that creator is is uh, is a personal creator is the next stage that you're going to to have to ask yourself. But to deny your createdness um, is is something quite extraordinary by saying there's no creator. So how do you deal with the challenges, the hypothetical challenges presented to the notion of created human beings, uh, the conflict between that and modern evolutionary theory as a modern thinker. I mean, the Catholics have accepted evolutionary theory, but that's my understanding of the situation. Yeah, guide, guided evolution, guided evolution, not this idea of randomness. I mean, the, get, the best response to that is, uh, I think, Robert Frost's poem called Accidentally on Purpose. That would be my answer. Somebody can, if they're interested, can Google it and look at it. But, you know, uh, I, this idea that, randomness um, that created this. I, I just, I won't buy that. And if, if, uh, if, if they want to say it's because I don't understand evolution, that's fine. I'll, I'll accept that. Uh. Yeah, well, I talked to Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins recently. I'm going to release the discussion I had with Dawkins. And the randomness argument's an interesting one because it's the variability between people that's in some sense random. But Sexual selection plays an awfully powerful force in evolutionary biology, and sexual selection is anything but random. And so to me, I see the action of consciousness, in, in perhaps in the ultimate sense, operating not least through the mechanism of sexual selection. So the selection mechanisms aren't random, even if the variation might be generated in part randomly. And it seems to me that there's something there that would reconcile the 
relationship in modern bio biology between the spirit and the matter, spirit and matter, let's say. So, because consciousness calls matter into being in some real sense. So. Well, consciousness also for us is a spiritual phenomenon. It's not, it's not a material phenomenon. And, and uh, you know, the, the ancients said that the, the one who denies the soul, that you'd have to determine him an idiot. Uh, it's, you know, they really saw it as a kind of absurdity to deny the, the existence of a soul. Because it's so clear if anybody's ever seen a corpse that something's very profoundly missing. So what, let's go back to practicalities with regards to Islam. And also I'd be interested in, you, you said that you chose, so I want to know what it, following the Islamic faith has done for your life personally. How, how has it helped you put yourself together? And also I'm interested in, again, why you found the Islamic tradition preferable, let's say, to the Orthodox tradition that you did you did enjoy the rituals that were part of that, at least. So let's deal with practical issues first. So, you, well, you just... I, yeah. Um, in terms of of uh, of why I chose Islam, I mean, I'm not completely convinced that I chose Islam. I mean, in some ways, Islam chose me as well. Um, so it's you know, guidance is a very strange thing for people. Like I saw an inevitability. When I look back on what happened, I saw an inevitability uh, of, of my uh, embracing Islam. I had some very interesting experiences that um, could be termed mystical or however uh, you want to determine them. But uh, the, the tradition itself, what, what struck me was one, I got to keep all of the prophets that I, I believed in already. And I added in addition, uh, what we consider to be the, the final prophet. And just as very often Christians marvel at how Jews miss Jesus, uh, Muslims also marvel at how Christians and Jews miss Muhammad. Although, to be fair to the Jews, they do acknowledge the prophet uh, as a providential force. And, and they do acknowledge him as a, a Noahidic messenger preparing the way for the the coming of the Messiah. So they do recognize that he was a providential force, at least the great, um, if you read George Kohler's book on Jewish theology as a chapter on Judaism and Islam, and certainly the great um, father of Orientalism, uh, Ignaz Golzeher, he actually said that he felt that Islam was the only religion that somebody of a philosophical bent could actually accept. And he wanted to to, to really bring in the gift of philosophy into Judaism that had been, uh, that the Muslims uh, had uh, so richly participated in. In fact, you know, there's an argument that just as Judaism prepared the way uh, for Christianity, it was Islam that prepared the way for, uh, for a philosophical Western Christendom. Because if you look at the transmission of all of that knowledge that comes into Europe, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, St. Thomas Aquinas, who's 13th century, he dies in 1274, and yet he's the doctor of the church. Just look at the number of times he quotes Muslims. I mean, he calls Averroes the commentator. So I think uh, Islam, and, you know, one of the beauties of the religion to me is that you'll find whatever you're looking for in it. I mean, Islam, you, you, it has a, a very simple theology that anybody can understand in Surah Al-Ikhlas, the chapter that says, say God is, is unique, uh, God is completely independent, God neither gives birth nor was God born, and there's nothing like God. So it, it gives you a very simple uh, theology that anybody can understand, and yet embedded in that simplicity is an extraordinary complexity that actually created a metaphysical tradition that Western scholars have spent their lifetime studying people like Henri Corbin or, or somebody. It's it's like uh, Maxine Rodinson, uh, not Maxine Rodinson, but uh, uh, the great uh, Catholic uh, theologian and and uh, metaphysician Jacques Maritain. You know, recognized the genius of people like Al Halaj and things. So within the Islamic tradition, there's just an extraordinary spectrum. You can spend your entire life and have a satisfying life. And I know people that have done this, just mastering 
the recensions of the Quran and the Qiraat, the, the actual uh, uh, oral uh, expression of the Quran through the, the rules of Tajweed. Um, you, you can spend your life studying exegesis. You can spend your life studying prophetic tradition. You can spend your life studying the great mystics of Islam. We have the best poets in the world. We also have the best architecture. I mean, there's nothing like the Taj Mahal or the Alhambra Palace. And even Western architecture, if you read uh, Stealing from the Saracens, she shows how some of the finest Western architecture was basically taken from the Islamic civilization, including Notre Dame in, in Paris. So you can find incredible, I know people that just uh, came to Islam through music. I mean, I know some really uh, professional musicians that fell in love with Arabic music, which led them into uh, Muslim culture, uh, people that um, love just, I mean, one of the most interesting things about Islam is it is a truly universal religion in that you can go from Indonesia to California and find all of these different expressions of the same central truths of Islam with their own local colorings. So the West African Muslims are not like the Middle Eastern Muslims. The Middle Eastern Muslims are not like the Indian Muslims. And you have people like, uh, you know, one of the great um, impressionist painters of, uh, of uh, Sweden. I think he's actually considered a national treasure in, in Sweden, but uh, his, his paintings hang in the museum there. He became Muslim uh, in, in jail in, uh, in um for, for actually, he, he shot a, a matador because he was raised by his father was a veterinarian and he shot a matador um, because he was so horrified that they were bringing bullfighting into France. And there was such an uproar that they actually released him. Uh, but when he was in jail, he befriended an Algerian who uh, used to recite Quran all the time. And he ended up becoming Muslim and, uh, and then studying in Egypt and then going back to... Uh, to his uh, native land. He died in Spain, uh, but extraordinary individual. So you have people like that. You have people that anybody can find what they're looking for. And, and that is the power of the faith, I think, is that it is truly a universal faith. And I think one of the things that Western people tend to do, one, they don't recognize that it's a Western faith because it is, it's part of the Abrahamic faith. Uh, it, it was in Spain for centuries. It's been in Eastern Europe for centuries. Um, and even Istanbul, which is the great capital of Islam for centuries, is half in Europe and half in, 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 in the East. And that's why it really bridges these two worlds. And so there's so much, I mean, well, why did all- part of the reason why I think it makes sense for religious people, Christians, Jews, and Islamic alike to focus on their commonalities in the face of the things that are disintegrating our cultures. We could start by trying to make some peace between us if we're going to consort ourselves reasonably as religious individuals. Right. And I commend you for trying to, to do some bridge building because, uh, you know, arguably um, there, there's been so much negativity around this faith and around its adherence that there's an almost instantaneous um, association with the most negative aspects of humanity with the religion. And, and it's, it's quite tragic. And so just as an exercise, a kind of bracketing for a second and try to, try to think about things, uh, a, a mentor of mine and a friend of mine, Dr. Thomas Cleary wrote a book called Zen Koans. He also translated the Quran. He's one of the brilliant translators of, the, of, uh, of our lifetime. But he wrote a book called Zen Koans. And in the introduction of that book, he actually says that the purpose of a koan is to snap people out of, of, of sloppy thinking. I think I read thinking. that book, yeah. But he says in there, but you don't need a koan to do that. Just ask an educated Western person what they think about Islam. And they'll start expressing all of these prejudices. And if you ask them, have you ever read the Quran? No. Do you know anything about the Prophet Muhammad? No. Uh, other than maybe something they read in a, uh, a newspaper article or in Time or Newsweek or the Atlantic Monthly, something yeah, like well, that. Yeah, well, it's not it's not an easy thing to try to get a toehold in a different tradition, especially it's when not you that don't hard. even have a toehold in your own. 
Yeah, I, it's not that hard, especially for an educated person. You're, you're obviously a highly educated person. It's not that hard. Islam, one of the things Gibbon said is that Islam spread because it's it was a very easy religion to understand. So this idea that I can't understand it, I can't, I'm having a hard time. It's not that hard to understand. I mean, Islam well, is actually a very straightforward. Okay, then give me a give me a five minute summary of the core beliefs. I, I don't want to put you on the spot. I, I, it's not a question. No, no, that, it's, not, it's not. That's not hard at all. The, so, that, so lay lay it out. That would be very so, helpful. So we have a famous hadith in which uh, we're, we're told that the, the angel Gabriel came in the form of a man and asked the prophet, tell me about faith. And, and the prophet Muhammad said, faith is to believe that there's only one God and that Muhammad, which includes all the previous messengers, is a messenger of God to believe in angels, to believe in the books that God has revealed, to believe in the last day, the day of judgment, and to believe in the uh, measuring out of good and evil, that good and evil is part of life. And then he said, tell me about Islam. And he said, Islam is that you uh, make the testimony of faith, that you pray five times a day, that you fast Ramadan, that you pay zakat, uh, the 2.5% of your standing wealth at the end, not your income tax, but your standing wealth at the end of a year, that's a whole year, 2.140 th is given to poor people. There's eight categories that are given in the Quran. And that you, if you're able to, you make a pilgrimage once in your lifetime to Mecca. And then he said, tell me about Ihsan, uh, which is the third dimension of Islam. And he said, and this is the dimension of virtuous being, like being a person of arity, of excellence in the world. And he said, Ihsan is to worship God as if you see God. And if you, and if you don't see him, at least you know that he sees you. So you have an awareness uh, of that, 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 you're, that there is a, a divine presence and you should be in a state of awareness in your behavior. I mean, one of the things about, you know, if you're driving and everybody's speeding and then somebody sees a cop, they all suddenly slow down. You know, I have a friend once who just zoomed past the cop when everybody slowed down and he pulled him over and he said, why didn't you slow down? He said, I felt like a hypocrite. <laughs> so the guy gave, he let him go. But, you know, that's people when they're in the presence of authority, they tend to behave well unless they're an utter rebel. I mean, there are those people. I'm trying to figure out how to be a Jew and a Christian and a Muslim at the same time. But become so, Muslim, that's the best way because the beauty of Islam is you get the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Last Testament. I mean, that really is, for me, even the Jews acknowledge this because Islam in many ways is a universalized Judaism. It's Judaism for the Gentiles. Uh, we, we have the mikvah, you know, they do ghusl, we have ghusl, I mean, you know, which is the ritual, uh, the, the baptism, a total immersion in water ritually to, to purify yourself, which is done at least once a week. And uh, Okay, so let me ask you, maybe I'll ask you, because we're, we're going to run out of time, I want to ask you a final question, then you can maybe help me in my aim. I've been trying to understand the Christian doctrine of the word and its relationship to the Jewish prophetic tradition for a long time. And I know that Christ is a central figure in Islam as well. I mean, the Christians make the claim that Christ is the son of God, right? He's the Messiah himself. And it's very difficult if you're going to be a Christian not to accept that claim. And I think I understand the claim in some sense psychologically. You know, I think the notion that the free word, the free truthful word is the fundamental redeeming force. I believe that's true. I think it's true literally, and I think it's true metaphorically, and I suspect it might be true religiously, although I'm not exactly sure what that means. And I think part of the stumbling block for me in relationship to Islam, you can understand Christianity in relationship to Judaism, but I can't understand Islam in relationship to Christ. Because I, I, I understand the Christian idea that Christ was a, what would you say, a, a transcendent consequence of the prophetic tradition and the Christian insistence that 
his life is associated with the divinity of the word, and that that is in some sense a final statement. And so I don't understand how Islam moves beyond that and still places Christ in a place of centrality. Well, so. I mean, the Jews don't accept Christ at all. Like the the best of the Jews will say he was a rabbi, but many of the rabbis considered him to be a charlatan, a, a, a magician. And and Jesus in the Talmud is, which was printed by Princeton University Press, you know, makes makes that argument that the Talmudic um, uh, views of Christ, which he they, he argues in that book that it was understandable given that the Jews were so persecuted uh, by the Christians, but um, the, the Muslim theology is, is a, uh, I think it's, it's a radical monotheism that, that even I think it transcends the monotheism of uh, Judaism, which has some anthropomorphic elements in it that uh, the Muslims would not accept. But generally the Jews and the Christians agree on the theology. Jew, Jew, rabbis, I've had many talks with rabbis and, and they, they see Islam in fact, Kohler says that Muslims were always seen as full proselytes of the Noahidic laws, whereas Christians were not because of the Trinity. So the Trinity is, you know, the, the principle of the triad is, a, you know, in Plato in the Timaeus uh, talks about that. So the principle of the triad is a very powerful principle. And there are many, many um, trinities in the world that we see. So, so I it is I, understand I, don't un I don't understand exactly why that constitutes such a stumbling block. I mean... And again, I'm trying to speak at least to some degree psychologically. Well, if you I mean, if you read, uh -huh. well, sorry, it it seems to me that the idea of the Holy Ghost is allied with the idea of conscience. You know that voice that speaks from within, and then the idea of the the Son element of the Trinity. That's the fact that divinity can reveal itself within a personality. Well, I think, and then that, the know, idea of God yeah. itself, himself, the God the Father, that seems to me to be the idea that's more t most tightly associated with the Jewish idea of the absolute and the Islamic idea of Allah. Well, I don't think but, so because uh, if you read Meister Eckhart or even Aquinas on Trinity, you know, uh, but Eckhart, the Godhead, you know, is is infinite, cannot be embodied, uh, is simple. There's no parts. So I think if you get into deep Catholic theology, you'll find that in the end, it is a type of unity. So the personas, mm -hmm. and they are called personas in Latin, means mask in Latin. Right. It's a mask, right. And so for, for Muslims, uh, Christ is a central figure, and Muslims do believe in a second coming of Christ, uh, born of the virgin birth, but Christ is not divine, Christ is human. And, and you'll find that in the dual nature, not in the monophysite or the diaphysite traditions of Christianity that you find like in Coptic Christianity and some of the monophysites that believed in that Christ was purely divine, but in this idea that Christ is of a dual nature. So the logos inheres, and that's a mystery. But I don't, I, this idea, I, Catholics never set, call like evangelicals they don't call on Christ as, you know, when they pray, they call on, on God, the, the Father, through an intercession of Christ, which is, I think, very different from worshiping Christ as the Godhead. Um, because, and, and I think it becomes very confusing, even for well, a lot I think of it is. I think it is confusing. And, and the fact that it is one of the stumbling blocks to something approximating a union of the great Abrahamic traditions is quite a problem. And well, we can agree on a lot of things. I mean, we certainly yes. agree on we agree that there is a God that He created us. We agree that the prophets were sent to warn people and to give them good news. And we agree that there's a day of judgment and people are going to be resurrected. I mean, we have, those are some pretty strong things to, to base uh, uh, a sense of, of shared concern on. We mm -hmm. certainly agree on family. We agree on the importance of raising children healthy. We all share the liberal arts tradition. Muslims, Christians, and Jews all share the tradition of the liberal arts, which well, is very, we very could important. Start, maybe we could start in our efforts to move forward by concentrating on those things that unite us. 
Well, also virtue, like virtue ethics. I mean, all three of our religions share virtue ethics, all three. And we all really acknowledge and and really have benefited greatly from the Nicomachean ethics. All three traditions recognize the Nicomachean ethics and its importance. Uh, And that's why our ethical tradition, our great treatises um, reflect many of the truths that Aristotle articulated in the Nicomachean ethics. Well, I think we should probably call that a day. I would like to keep talking to you. Um, I think it's very useful to outline. I think it was very useful to outline the central tenets of Islamic faith. I think it's very useful to begin a reconceptualization in some sense in the intellectual sphere that it might be useful for all the people of the Abrahamic traditions to recognize their similarities moving forward rather than concentrating on their differences. I mean, we could we could start by assuming that perhaps our differences are in some sense apparent and a consequence of our ignorance. You know what I mean? It's not like any of us can claim to be omniscient interpreters even of our own faith tradition. And so we could say, well, there's a lot of confusion that reigns and that disunites us and we'll be a little careful about making any authoritarian authoritative claims on behalf of our own faith and and see, because we need to figure out how to tolerate each other and to appreciate each other. And I also think the disunion between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is also one of the sicknesses that besets the West. The fact that that disunity exists makes it more difficult for people who are searching for something akin to a tradition to believe that there's something solid there, because even those who are staunch adherents of their own traditions don't seem to be able to get along with those who are staunch traditions holders of others. So anyways, discussions like this are some markers on the pathway to peace, let's say. There's a, we have an important tradition from our prophet that says, woe unto those who arrogate to themselves the judgment of God. Yeah, and, that's and, for and, sure. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and he was asked, how do they do that? And he said, by saying these people are in hell and these people are in paradise. You know, so that's something no Muslim is permitted to death. Like I could never say you're going to hell or I mean, some people do that, but it's it's absolutely prohibited in the Islamic tradition to do yeah, that. Well, the problem with making a judgment like that is it's pretty easily turned upon yourself. Well, exactly. Yeah. It was really good of you to talk to me today. I appreciate it very much. All right. Um, I have a message here. My my uh, my camera person who set this up just put a little message. He wanted me to mention the hadith of the prophet in which he said, none of you will enter paradise by your actions, but by the grace of God alone. So we need deeds, but in the end, We're justified through grace. Thank you very much. I hope we get a chance to speak again. Where are you located? I'm in Berkeley, ground zero for the dissolution of the the Western civilization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm coming to California in uh, very soon. Maybe I'll see if you'd like to come. Well, if you do, yeah. Sure. And and come visit the college. You know, we have a small liberal arts college um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to uh, revive a tradition that's fallen on hard times in both the West and the East. But mm-hmm. it's an important mm-hmm. tradition and it's the greatest bulwark against uh, a lot of the things that we're up against, because it, it really does teach people to. To discern between real and apparent goods. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, good luck in that endeavor. Truly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Take care, Dr. Peterson.